swinging a high drive in the center field. Hits at the wall. It is gone. Passes does it again. Again. It's gone. It's into the bullpen. This game is tied. This game is tied. He swings and rips one to center field. It's high. It's deep. It's back. It's gone. Sale winds. He fires. Swing and a miss. Right play. It's over. The Red Sox have won. What's up? Welcome back to Play Tessie. This is episode 90. Episode 90 is dropping on July 5th, so happy not 4th of July anymore if you're listening on Drop Day. This is the official podcast of Matt Andrees, also known as the official Red Sox podcast of WEEI. Before we get going, hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening on the Odyssey app, Spotify, or Apple. Hit the subscribe button, rate us five stars, helps us out a ton. And if you're on YouTube, go to YouTube. Go to the WEI page. You can find us there. We've got a Play Tessie playlist. Hit the thumbs up on our videos. That helps us out a ton, too. And if you're watching on YouTube, go to the podcast platforms and subscribe there because it helps us out. Also, check us out on the socials at Play Tessie on both Twitter and Instagram. Here with Sammy and Pat. Sox coming off a big sweep of the Miami Marlins. It it didn't go in the third game as we would have hoped or expected. It felt like it was going to be quick. You know, Nick Pavetta, no hitter through six and two thirds innings. It felt like it was going to be a quick, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good night at the ballpark in Miami, but it didn't go that way. The game goes 12 innings, but you know what? We don't really care because the Sox get the win. They are eight games above 500 at 47 and 39. This is the first time all year that they've been eight games above 500. They are fighting in this wild card race. The Red Sox are in the thick of it. Sammy, Pat, Fellas, it's July 4th, man. We're recording because we are committed. How are you guys feeling on this day? Buy, buy, buy your stock in the Boston Red Sox. I'm having a good time. This is all I wanted out of this season. They're playing competitive games, coming down the stretch towards the trade deadline. I'm happy. I mean, from the get-go, they started off hot. We were talking about, is this team good? And I said, wait till July. July is kind of the barometer here. Guys, it's july and they're the highest over i know exactly what you're thinking (laughs) yeah you know exactly what i'm thinking but yeah no vibes vibes are way too good to watch our mouths it's even it doesn't matter if it's in the first five minutes there was so i just feel like there's so much that like how long ago does it feel like wick grossbeck announced that he was selling the celtics and we were freaking out over would john henry buy the celtics and like that was that before the first game of the series, or was that after the first game? I feel like that was before it started. That was before. That was before the first game. I don't know. I don't even want to think about that. Was, That's like the most scary, harrowing thing to think about is John Henry torching another Boston team. I don't know. I, I'm just happy that this Boston team, the Red Sox, are doing well in spite of John Henry. No credit at all to that guy. <laughs> just happy the Red Sox are doing well. This is like, oh man, I, I that that game, you know, it's tough to kind of analyze these things in the moment. Was that the most up and down game of the season? Because I was like feeling great. Oh my god, we're gonna lose a game to the friggin' Marlins. Oh my god, look at Zach Kelly comes in, shuts it down. Oh, okay, they blew it. Like up and down for for hours today. It, it might be, Sammy. It might have been. Because to be honest with you, the up and down games happen when the bullpen struggles. And to be honest with you, for the majority of the season, the Red Sox bullpen just hasn't struggled. Like their ERA isn't necessarily the best bullpen ERA in baseball, but when they've needed to get outs in important spots, they've gotten it. Like the ERA is what it is because of lower leverage guys pumping that ERA up. But yeah, I, Pat, you said, I want to go back to something you said because I have, I have a question because I saw some people talking on Twitter and it, and it, it put a thought in my mind. You said, wait till July and talk to me. It is, it is now July. We're into July. The Red Sox haven't lost in July. They are on now a four game winning streak. They, they won the last game against the Padres and they have now beaten the Marlins three straight games. So they will go into the Bronx to face the ice cold Yankees on a four game win streak. But I just like, I find so many parallels between what we're seeing right now and kind of what we saw each of the last two years, they peaked both years in the June or July timeframe. And I can tell you this because both, both seasons died when I went to go see them on the road. So two years ago, 
they it was right at July 4th. They went to Wrigley Field to play the Cubs, who were terrible at the time, and they lost two of three, and they should have gotten swept, and they almost got swept, but they didn't. And then the season was just downhill from there. And then the next year, it was – oh, and then they also – they got they got smoked when uh, Chris Sale got hit with the line drive. I was at that game, too, on the road. So either way, I was on the road, and I killed the season. Um, the next year, it was right around the trade deadline. They go to San Francisco to play the Giants. They win the first game, but then they lose the next two. And then in Seattle, they don't add at the trade deadline, and Justin Turner gets hurt, and then they get swept by the Blue Jays, and the season went downhill from there. But – both of those seasons had massive peaks in this June, July time frame, which is what I feel now. So my question to you guys, and, and Pat, I'll start with you because you triggered the thought of my mind here. Is this team, is it the same? Are we about to under, to under Are we about to go through the same shit or is this different? Is this team different than the last two years that we've seen? So I think, so my point was today. That felt like a game from 2022 or 2023 where they implode and that just starts the downhill avalanche. We've seen that for two years. That is exactly the thought that went through my brain today. The team last year, the team two years ago, loses that game 100 times out of 100. I can promise you that. I think it's different this year. I think the starting pitching is legit. The bullpen is legit. Raffi is knock on wood, killing it, healthy, whatever. Duran is a top 10, 12 player in baseball right now, killing it. O'Neill's starting to get it going. Masataka Yoshida's even hitting now. I think the, there's more pieces in place right now than there were in 22 and 23 and less flukiness to it. I think that's a big thing too because I believe it was 22 where Pavetta, it was when he pitched in Tampa, just shut shit down. And we're like, this team's so good. And then they just immediately fell off a cliff. I don't see that happening this year. I'm not saying they're 100% making the playoffs, but I don't see them getting to that five, six, seven games under 500 again. I don't. Well, at the bare minimum, and Sammy, I want to get your take on this too, but at the bare minimum, I know it. the pitching hasn't been as good as it was in April, but the way to sustain performance is to get solid pitching and they and for the most part and certainly in this series with the starters the starters were great in the Marlins series but for the most part this year they've gotten good pitching so I, I do think that that gives you a little bit hope that it could be more sustainable Sammy what do you think is it is it the same as the last couple of years or are they going to sustain this this time around hard to say that's that's a tough question almost an impossible question but I like the word choice you just used Gordo you said sustain and when I think sustain I think of innings pitched which makes me think this team, if they want to have a chance at the playoffs, they cannot be selling off pieces. Can't be selling Pavetta. Can't be selling off Jansen. They need innings. We saw Pavetta go deep into the game today. That was nice. Bayo went deep into the game at, on uh, Wednesday as we record. So is it sustainable? Maybe. Kind of a non-answer from me, but I'd feel a lot better about this team, the, the team's success being sustainable if they add an arm or two here. As the deadline approaches, we're about what, like three weeks away, a little bit more than three weeks. So yep. Yep. with the guys they have now at the moment, I'll say no, just because I don't think they have the depth. It's not the lack of talent. It's just the depth. But I don't think they're far off from being sustainable, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the last two years, if you look at 22 and 23 and compare it to now, what what's different? So the pitching is is certainly better. But I agree with you, Sammy, if they don't add to it. That could be a problem. And we'll see if that's different. Because one thing we know about the last two years is they didn't really add to the team. They added some guys in 22, but they subtracted two. And they kind of came out with a with a mixed vibe in the clubhouse. And, you know, you, you couldn't really tell if they got better or worse. And then last year, it was just they added Luis Arias. And guys were upset that they didn't add enough. And, you know, they they needed arms and they didn't get arms. The arms were falling apart at the deadline last year and it was because of the bullpen games and they didn't add to it. So we'll see if that's different this year. Uh, the one thing that I will say is similar this year to the other years or I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll say to two years ago, because I can't I can't really remember if there was a, an injured guy at this point last year, but they're playing really well right now without Tristan Casas. And it kind of reminds me of two years ago when we were saying, wait till Chris Sale gets back. And granted, Chris Sale came back and then immediately got hit in the hand, and he really was only he was only back for one start and one inning. So hopefully Tristan Casas comes back and he's back 
not just longer than that, but the rest of the way. So hopefully that can be different. The one thing that's actually different, though, that we can tangibly tell, though, is the athleticism of this team. The It's just a different lineup out there. Duran is a different player than he's ever been. He's playing with more confidence than he's ever played with. He's hitting the ball better. He's playing way better defense than he's ever played. Like he's always been this athletic, but I don't, I can't remember him like that play on the base paths in the third game of the series where he got into a pickle and it was like, okay, let's see where this goes. Cause you knew he wasn't like out, out. And then he gets to third. Like we didn't see too many things like that. And like, obviously David Hamilton was not here for the last couple of years or I guess he was for a little bit last year, but he certainly wasn't this. And it was only a few games. And then Sedan wasn't here at all the last couple of years when they were in contention. So having those three guys in your lineup, the ability to do what they do on, on a baseball field is something that not just the Red Sox haven't had the last couple of years, but most teams don't have. Yeah. Gordo. The other thing too, as you said, two years ago was sale last year was story. He got the elbow surgery, came back in August. Uh you're right. That's what it was. Good point. But the thing now is, like, last year you thought Story was going to come back, and they were kind of, like, middling at that point, and you're like, oh, once they get Story back, they're taken off. 22, it was, okay, they're all right right now. Just wait till the ace gets back. They're playing eight game above 500 baseball, and they're, I mean, at this point, probably third best hitter behind Duran and Devers. I think so. He's out. When he comes back, even if he's not 100%, no offense to Dom Smith, he's going to give you better numbers than Dom Smith. He's going to give you better production than you've had for the past two months at first base. There's no lose in that scenario like there was when Story comes back and hits 205 or when Sale comes back and gets hurt again. Yeah. You're not relying on him. You're not yeah. relying on him this time. It's like a bonus. Like If you want to make a deep playoff run, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this team is going to make a deep playoff run, but if they want that, of course, they're going to need Tristan Casas. But to maintain a winning record and to fight for a playoff spot right now, modest additions, I think, would get that done. But uh, let me back up, Gordo, to the point you made a minute ago and allow me to date myself because you guys like to talk about my my advanced age at almost 30. But this has never, ever, ever, ever been the identity of the Red Sox speed agility like this the red Sox forever have been a doubles home runs team and that is nothing wrong with that you play at fenway park of course you're going to be a doubles home runs team that's what that park you know that's what that park allows but this speedy red Sox team with the athleticism of duran hamilton romy gonzalez even connor wong the catcher it's just unbelievable and it's it's like a new a new a new kind of red Sox baseball to watch so I'm not going to argue that this is the best Red Sox team we've ever seen. It's not even close, but this is a fun team. And I think if you if you break this team down, there's a lot of things to like about today, but a lot of things to like about the future. So if you're a Red Sox fan watching this team and you're kind of a 162-ish guy, you watch most of the games, don't overthink it. This is a fun team. I'm I'm really enjoying myself. And that's, we spoke about in the offseason. I just want to have meaningful baseball down the stretch. And right now that's what we're trending for. So, so no complaints for me. It's interesting. That's it's the beauty of baseball in a way that there's so many different ways to win baseball games. Like the Red Sox teams that we have seen be successful have had horses for starting pitchers and power at the plate. And this team has been successful because they're more athletic than everyone that they're playing. And they've got a good bullpen. They're certainly locked down in the back end like like i said earlier like we we have we don't have games like we saw on sunday because almost always guys like kenley jansen chris martin justin slayton they're getting the job done like how many how many games have those guys actually like really blown this year it can't be more than a couple i like i can barely remember any off the top of my head but i think another key to this and i'm, I'm i want to talk about these two guys i guess we'll go one at a time uh, we'll start with Bayo, just because I feel like there was a lot of anticipation there. But if the Red Sox are going to, if this is going to be sustainable, like the Red Sox are not about to go out there and add two starting pitchers at the deadline. If they're going to be good down the stretch, it's going to be because Brian Bayo bounces back. He was really, really, really good in the second game of the series. Let up a run, let up three quick hits in the first inning, and it felt like you were about to see more of the same. I, it was really encouraging to not see him fall apart. It felt like, like when I was watching the game, I was thinking, oh my God, if a second run scores, we might be in for it here. And the second run didn't get home. 
And he ended up going six and two thirds innings, only allowing the one run that he allowed in the first. The velocity is crazy. The stuff is moving. He only walked one batter, which I, I keep rattling off that stat about how many starts in a row that he keeps walking multiple guys. I, w- I was really encouraged because the one thing, like you're facing the Marlins, yes, but if you're throwing the ball all over the place, you're going to keep walking people. So do you guys, like, do you attribute Bale's return here to to form is that because he returned to form or was it because he was facing the marlins sammy i'll start with you it's impossible to tell Uh, like you could you could argue for either side there's no way to deny either however i do want to make a point about bayo's start and not not to ignore the question i just i just don't know how to answer it that was exactly exactly what we needed to see that first inning it got hairy quickly I'm not sure what happened. It was what uh, a single, a single and a walk. He got kind of babbipped a little bit in the first inning. The Marlins got some, you know, they were swinging early. Hits. Yeah, they were swinging early. They got some some doinky doinky hits, and you know that happens. Credit to the Marlins for being aggressive. They had a good scouting report. And I remember I texted our group chat with the three of us and Joe, and I said, "Okay, now we have to see can Bayo keep his composure? Marlins are a good team to try that against. Doesn't get much easier than that, but." That's where we're at with Bayo, who entered the game with a five and a half ERA. And right when Jake Berger came up, that Jake Berger at bat really stood out to me because Bayo pumped a 99, 98, 98, one ball, two strikes, finishes him off with a changeup. Nasty. And from that moment on, something clicked and Bayo was absolutely unhittable for the rest of the game. He didn't go seven innings like we wanted him. I think it was 6.1 or 6.2. But... He didn't let the early inning struggles and, you know, a little bit of bad luck. He didn't let that get to him, which was the biggest takeaway of all. That was really impressive. And I know it was the Marlins, but that's what we needed to see. We needed to see him keep his composure. And that's what he did. Yeah. I mean, Pat, give me your thoughts on Bayo here. It's the, but before, I guess the one thing I'll say is, Sammy, you're talking about 99, 98, 98. Yep. The stuff and the movement that you see from him is why, like, I might, I might, mail it in in a sense for the season because I, I I'm just I've been con- so concerned with what we've seen but seeing that velocity and the movement that's on his change up and his sinker like I, I I will always believe in the Brian Bayo ceiling because of that but Pat just like for this year do you think that this start is a building block towards better things to come from Bayo yeah I mean he put a lot of self-pressure on himself I think people we're saying this had to be a good start. This ha- this has to be a turning point. And he didn't shy away. He said, this is a new season for me. This is the beginning. Went out there, pitched great a little bit, or we'll see how much, I guess, is accredited to the opponent. But I think if he pitches like that against a better team, the results would probably look pretty similar because he was disgusting. That being said, he gets the Marlins to kind of get himself back on track, pitch pitches fantastic his next scheduled start if they don't skip a turn actually even if they do skip a turn he has the athletics up next that is two straight starts where you can kind of get your bearings get yourself right figure whatever it is for the back half and then his next turn out based on the schedule is going to be the royals of the dodgers so he has one more start to really hammer shit home and then he gets a real test okay that's i mean i guess that's a good way to go about it He's going to have to get tested at some point. And if, again, if they're going to go anywhere this year, he's going to have to be good for them down the stretch. And that's not just to say that he needs to figure out what's going on right now. You got to remember, he fell apart at the end of last year because he'd start, he'd hit innings numbers that he'd never hit before. So getting past that threshold is going to be something like we always, we think about that for Hauk and for Cutter for the most part, but that's going to be an issue for a guy like Bayo too. So that's another reason to get an arm. Uh, before we jump into a preview, I do want to talk a little bit about Masataka Yoshida because he's been playing a little bit better. We've been very hard on him on this podcast. I have been very hard on him. We all have. But he was riding pretty high after the Padre series. Goes three for five in the first game, two for four in the second game. Did go 0 for four with two strikeouts in the third grade in the third game. No one was really hitting in the third game, but he, that did happen. If the Red Sox are going to get a bat at the deadline, to me, 
it feels like a lot like Yoshida's at bats will get eaten into, particularly against lefties. He's been playing against lefties just because they have so many. They don't have enough right handed bats and they don't have enough right handed talent. So he gets in there still DH is against the lefty. He did it in the second game of the series. How are you guys feeling about Yoshida? I guess I don't, I, don't, I was going to give you a meter, but just give me your general vibes on Yoshida. Are you believing at all? No, I'm the same. I'm the same with Yoshida. I've always thought and I've always maintained that he can hit. It's not a bad bat at all. Solid. You know, he doesn't strike out. That's a plus with this Red Sox team. They have a few guys who K a lot, but it's just, it's still not enough for me. Like he puts the ball in play. He'll get you his singles. Sometimes he'll hit a double, but like there's not much power. There's no speed. He doesn't play defense. It's so, it's going to take a real, real lot for me to buy into Yoshida as what we thought he was going to be when he signed early in the offseason in 2020, late 2022 or early 2023, whatever it was. But he, you have to be so, so good at hitting to only have one tool. And I just feel like even with this little hot stretch, I'm still not buying it. I'd still be happy if they found a way to offload the contract. And I'd still rather a solid right handed bat in there instead of him. Now, if there's bases loaded and you need one run, yeah, okay, cool. I'd be thrilled with Yoshida up. But outside of that specific scenario where you need just the ball in play, it's it's a really, really tough sell for me. And I like him. He seems like a good guy. I've never heard a bad word about him, but the, the profile just isn't there for me. It's not enough. I need more. Pat, quick thought on Yoshida before we preview? Yeah. I, no, I'm with Sammy. I think... The perfect example of a one tool guy who you can live with is someone like Luis Arias. Like that is a guy who, even though all he can do is hit for contact, he does it the best of anybody in the league. And that's kind of, he was going to be like Arias light coming over. It It's not put together And like, he goes to these really hot stretches where he looks to fit that profile. But yeah, he's in the middle of a hot streak right now, but I, I'm just not buying it. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think they're in a perfect spot just because you've got not a full month, but close to a full month to see what you have in him, to see if the, the thumb is healthy, to see if he can work the kinks out of his swing. If he keeps the hot streak going, like it takes a lot of pressure off of the front office, especially if he hits against lefties. If he doesn't, if he, do, if, if he comes back down to where he was before, if it was just like a weak stretch, then yeah, you're going to need to get a bat and make sure he's not in the lineup against lefties. It's just going to be the way it is. Uh, before we get to the preview, got to remember, series MVP picks, boys. What do we got? I feel like there was a couple candidates. It's tough because after the first two games, my head was at Sedan Rafaela. But now it's like Jaron Duran had a home run earlier in the series, and he gunned down the winning run at the plate. Do you go with that? Like, Do you go Let with tell you. Pavetta, who had such a great Let start, almost no hit the Marlins? Please, Sammy, Gordo, enlighten me. It's Rafael Devers. He had six RBIs this series. That's two RBIs a game. I think the conversation ends there. He was, he did his job. He did what he's being paid to do. We often kind of skew the conversation about the superstar players in this league. And I think that straight up, Raphael Devers is here to create runs. And that's exactly what he did all three games of the series two, two, two RBIs each game. Easy MVP. Good defense, too. Was it two in each game? Two, two, two. Wait, I'm looking right now. Yeah. Ooh. Two RBIs on July okay. 4th, two okay, RBIs see. on July 3rd, two RBIs on July 2nd, two, two, two. Could... And also three walks today, three. Well, he got intentionally walked twice. It counts. It counts. It counts. But Rafael also had six RBIs. He had, he had the three run blast that broke the first game open and he had the three run double that broke the second game open. But man, two, it's hard to argue with two, 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 especially with a game like the third game today, it's like, yeah, you could say the game doesn't get won with Jar without Jaron Duran's throw, but Rafi has two RBIs. It was a big single. Wait, when was the... No, the big single was in the first game where he hit it off a guy's glove and they got two runs early. Either way. Sammy, I'll join you there. 2-2-2, two, 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 you can't argue with that. I'll vote for Devers. Yeah, no, I'm going to go with Devers too. I mean, six RBI, and then the reason... I'm picking him over Rafaela is solely because of the triple celebration with his tongue out with a giant lip of dip in. <laughs> that's my reason. That's the tiebreaker right there for me. I'm going Rafaela. You, what, what did you like more, his tongue or the dip? I think the combo is what made it because it looked like a chipmunk showing an acorn. <laughs> Rafi Devers, the king of acorns. Chipmunk Cheeks Devers. That's what you used to call Jorge Posada. I thought he looked like a chipmunk. 
It looked like a ferret. But okay, so congratulations to Raphael Devers. I'm sure this is not his first series MVP, but he is the play Tessie series MVP for the Marlins series. Let's get going on this series preview. We got a good one coming, guys, because the Sox are headed to the Bronx. Sox are hot. Yanks are ice cold. The Yankees are coming in. They are 54 and 35, but they're coming off getting swept by the Reds. You guys remember that tweet the Yankees Twitter account tweeted with uh with Verdugo smiling with like a cup of coffee after he had that huge game in the first game against the Red Sox? Well, since that tweet, the Yankees are four and thirteen. They are ice cold. All right, and here we go with the pitching matchups. You got Tanner Houck versus Nestor Cortez in the first game. Houck has a two six seven coming off his worst start of the year, four and a third, eight runs, seven earned against the Padres. Nestor Cortez has a 3-5-1. He's coming off four and a third innings of three-run ball and five strikeouts against the Jays. Second game, Josh Winkowski versus Rafi Devers' son, a.k.a. Garrett Cole. Josh Winkowski has a 2 80 RA. He's coming off five scoreless with one strikeout against the Padres. He has 11 innings pitched and two earned runs since his return to the bigs. Garrett Cole has made three starts since his return from an elbow injury that almost resulted in Tommy John but did not. He has a 6-2-3 ERA. He's coming off five innings of one run ball and six strikeouts against the Blue Jays, which is far better than his second one. Uh, third game, Cutter Crawford against Luis Heal. Cutter's got a 3-4-7 ERA coming off six innings of one run ball and seven strikeouts on just 72 pitches against the Marlins. So he should still be fresh. It was really good to see Cutter Crawford looking fresh out there. Luis Heal was killing it. Easy rookie of the year favorite. Still probably is the rookie of the year favorite, if we're being honest. But... Yeah. He's got a 3-4-1 ERA, but he's coming off three straight horrific starts. Inning in a third of seven-run ball, four and a third innings of five-run ball, and four innings of four-run ball. So hopefully the Red Sox can pile on to Luis Heal there. Hitting stats, it's literally just Aaron Judge and Juan Soto. They've got an 11-35 and a 10-06 OPS, respectively. Uh, nobody else in the lineup that has played a meaningful amount of games has an OPS over 703. Ben Rice and Jemai Jones are both have in the 700s, <laughs> but they've only played... 28 and 18 games. Alex wait, wait, Gordo, Gordo, wait, 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 wait. Nobody in the lineup other than Judge and Soto have like a 700 OPS. Well, Ben Rice will be in there and he does, but he's only played 28 games. And oh like Alex, God. Alex Verdugo, he had three hits today. I, the stat was way better before today. Do how he, stupid are the Yankees? How do you, how stupid are these guys? You build a lineup with two. I, I can't, I cannot believe how dumb the Yankees have become. All right. Anyway, I don't want to talk reference. shit. Wait, wait. For reference, real quick. The Sox had a bunch of pinch hitters, substitutions, whatever, however you want to say it. They had seven guys play today with OPSs over 703. Well, there you go, man. And do, I'm telling you, it was like 680 something before today. I was, re I was ready to go. The, the 703 thing really, it makes the stats sound so much worse. He is ice cold. He is 11, even though he had three hits today, Verdugo in, on Sunday. He is 11 for 63 since that big game against the Red Sox when the Yankees then sent out the tweet with him holding the coffee. So Trent Grisham also playing well, <laughs> uh, although he had that crappy error at the end of the game today. He got booed at Yankee Stadium. But before today's game, he had a 942 OPS in his previous 23 at-bats. And before today, Austin Wells had a 906 OPS in his seven, last 17 at-bats. And then he hit a home run today. So that, I'm sure, goes up. But Joe, I'm going to bring you in, Joe Braverman. Big Brave Dog, Braverman, Producer Joe, get us these series prediction score updates. What is up, fellas? Let me tell you all about the series. We had two of the four of us grab points with Pat correctly predicting the sweep. Sammy incorrectly thought that they would lose one, uh, lose two out of three. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I had two out of three Red Sox wins. Okay, okay, okay. Like yeah, I think I don't think Sammy predicted them to lose. To the I said they, I said no they lose the middle. I said they lose the middle game because there's a lefty. Oh, that's right. Bay. We said the same thing. Sammy and I okay, both had that's two it. out of well, three. All right. Well, either way, either, we still suck. Yeah, you don't get a point. Um, <laughs> you and Gordo uh, said two out of three, both incorrect. Myself and Pat pick up points for correctly predicting a Red Sox sweep. So according to the standings, Sammy still leads with nine. Pat has jumped into second with five. Gordo has five. And I have four. Big Brave Dog, you're at four and you've had so many fewer picks. I want you to go first. 
because Ooh. maybe I'll piggyback your pick if I like it. Okay, okay. Um, let's see here. It's the Yankees. They took two out of three last time. So I'm going to say... I'm gonna say they do it again. I, I think I think they go two out of three. Um, I like Tanner Houck against this uh, Yankee lineup, um, and plus the Yankees are skidding, so I think it's the perfect time for the Sox to uh, head into Yankee Stadium and uh, spoil a couple of things for the Bronx Bombers. So I'll go two out of three. Two out of three. All right, Pat, you you tied me in second. That means you're going second. What do you got? I think they sweep. Oh, Red Sox. Back to they back sweep. sweeps. My goodness. I Red think Sox they sweep because Gordo, it's what? Nestor, Garrett, and Heel? Yep. <laughs> Garrett Cole. Okay. So I like how head to head against Nestor. Garrett Cole, I don't think, has had a good start since he's been back. I would be stunned if his first good start this year is against the Red Sox. I'd be appalled. And then third, I'm just praying that Luis Heel's cold streak keeps up. I think they win. All three. You know, Pat, I'll follow you on that because I'm also going to take a sweep. I, I'm riding high, man. I like the matchups. Third game's on ESPN, Sunday Night Baseball. Sox oh, that was my point. They, they always, own, it always feels own like that ass on Sunday Night Baseball. Yeah. So they're going to own Sunday Night Baseball. They're going to own Garrett Cole. And then you're basically just asking Tanner Houck to beat Nestor Cortez. I know Nestor's a lefty, so that could be kind of tough, but also Nestor's kind of booty. I don't know. Give me a sweep. Sox sweep. Let's get it. Sammy, what do you got? I'm positive, but not as positive as you guys. I think they win two out of three, which would be great. I think they lose the first game. Hauk has not looked great his last two starts. Nestor is a lefty. He does suck, but he's a lefty. So I think maybe that's the game the Yankees steal. Garrett Cole is an absolute fucking pumpkin out there. He looks terrible. I don't know why the Yankees are having him pitch through this very obvious injury. He's probably going to miss a year at some point. And then Luis Heel Gill, uh, whatever his neck tattoo says, he sucks now. He has been awful for three starts in a row. He was leading candidate for rookie of the year, but he's a bum now, so he's probably not going to win that. That's a shame. Uh, and then Alex Verdugo, Captain Clown Shoes, just looks like absolute dog shit out there. He's rubbing off on the other Yankees. Like uh, one of you mentioned, uh, Trent Grisham totally dogged it out there. Let a runner get from second, from first to second on a like line drive directly to the center fielder. That's embarrassing. That's the Verdugo effect right there. Red Sox fans know that well. These guys are built to choke. The Yankees absolutely fucking suck. I think the Red Sox win two out of three. But hey, I wouldn't be shocked if you guys were right. These guys are a joke of a team. Sorry, once proud franchise. It's it's funny. You you tell you talk about the Verdugo effect. It's got me thinking. And we'll we'll go to you, Pat, in a sec for Crystal Bomb. But I just I find it so funny. Red Sox fans warned the Yankee fans about Verdugo. They did. They warned him over and over again. They said it's gonna that he's gonna make you fall in love in spring training. He's gonna start out hot. You're gonna love the guy. And then around the All Star break is when it starts to tail. And honestly, he started to tail a little bit sooner than he has in the past. But Red Sox fans, Boston fans are right again. It reminds me a little bit of the Kyrie thing, where he goes to the Nets, has love goggles. The Nets fans fall in love, and Celtics fans are saying like, guys, like just. Reel it in. He's gonna piss you off. He's gonna he's gonna give up, and you're gonna hate him. And sure enough, they hate him too. I'm telling well, you, stop. Gordo, Boston fans always get it right. We do, we do. We're we're definitely the, the smartest fans there are. But also, like the difference is with Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving's very talented. He's a really talented basketball player. Some of the best handles we've ever seen. He's a great shooter. He can score. Really All right, we don't need to, we don't need to do that on this. As show. much Come as on. we, yeah, no, 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 no. I know. As much as we hate him, he's really good. The thing with Alex Verdugo is he sucks. <laughs> so w when you look at Verdugo and you're like, oh, he's, he's terrible. You're like, why are you surprised? With Kyrie Irving, you point to the skill set. Yeah, this guy should be good. Verdugo's not good at anything. He just puts the ball in play pretty much, and then he dogs it. Gets thrown out by 50 feet. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wish Yankees fans would uh, listen to us more. We tried to warn them. We were friends with some Yankees fans. We were, we were letting them know because we care about them. We don't want yeah. them to be devastated when he inevitably shits the bed, which he already has multiple times after that cheesy ass fake picture of him pretending to give a shit um, about not being on the Red Sox anymore. So yeah, I'm not a fan of Alex Verdugo. If you couldn't tell, I don't like his attitude. I don't like the way he carries himself. I don't like the way he played in Boston. I don't like the way he's uh well, actually I guess, I guess I do like the way he's played in New York. So um yeah, I get the Kyrie Irving comparison, but one of these guys has talent. The other one, <laughs> not so much. I, for the record, I hate Kyrie Irving significantly more. I don't hate Alex Verdugo. 
I, I, he pisses me off a little bit, but I don't hate him. I hate Kyrie, but yeah, I, I gotta, definitely dislike Kyrie more. Yeah, come on, <laughs> to be fair, be, but be. but Verdugo's on the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hate that, yeah. hate that team. So Verdugo, I, I I equally hate Verdugo to Kyrie right now. But the second he leaves the Yankees, Kyrie retakes that first. Plus the Celtics just embarrassed Kyrie, so there's a little bit of the heat taken off of that. But um, yeah, I that's the that. difference. That is that Ky- uh, Kyrie? We hate him, but he's supremely talented. Verdugo, uh, contrary to that, he sucks. So, all right, Pat, what do we got, buddy? What's the time for? Let's go. Crystal bomb. Bomb it. Bomb it. Joe. Can we get a score update? Uh, only because you asked nicely, I can gladly do that. Uh, one crystal bomb in this past series from some guy named Sammy, courtesy of Jaron Duran. So Sammy, again, closing the gap on Gordo, the leader. Gordo still leads it with 13. Sammy right there in second with 10. Pat is still in third with five. And then it's me with two. Well, two. He's building on me. Sure am. Um, all right, yeah, I'll go first. Can I go, go. first? <laughs> yes, go. Raphael Devers, easy. Next. I hate you. I hate that I I picked Devers for good reason in the Padres series, and I was right, but it kills me because I can't pick him in the Yankees series. He's literally facing Garrett Cole. I can't believe you didn't save him. I, I like weeks ago. I'm like, all right, I gotta avoid Devers. I'm going to pick him three weeks before or three series before the Yankees so I can use him again. This is easy. I, I'm i going to go. I'll go second. Uh, I am going to pick Jaron Duran. I think this is going to be a statement statement sweep for the Red Sox. And if they're going to statement sweep, it's going to come with a Jaron Duran bomb or two. I could see it on Sunday Night Baseball. So we'll go Jaron. I'll go. I'm going. Th- yeah, go ahead, Pat. Th- oh, I'm going to steal it because I think you're going to take him. I'm going thick, Willie. Damn it! <laughs> that short porch in right field is built for thick Willie. I'm going Willie or Abreu. He's, He's ice cold. <laughs> He's ice cold. That's a risk. That's a risky one. Yes, he hit one. I'm to he hit a bomb hit, in New York. He hit one off Jazz's head. It almost went out in the in the that's last true. series. <laughs> that was great. True. Jazz Jazz is the most overrated player in baseball. My God, He's oh, I don't want to say he sucks, but he's just not good. All right, well, Joe, what about Alex Verdugo or Volpe? <laughs> but enough people say those guys sucks. No one says Jazz sucks. What? Everyone says Jazz sucks. He got the cover of the game, and he's terrible. I, he's not terrible. He's just not as good as we thought he'd be. Yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of I feel bad for Jazz Chisholm. I feel like that was a lot to put on him. He probably didn't have a choice. So Yeah, I feel bad for him, man. He's the cover of the video game. <laughs> oh, poor Jazzy. Ah! Yeah, come on, man. I mean, he's not. He, he probably didn't. Didn't Jeter put that in for him? He put in the request is what I heard. I don't know. God. Uh, Boo hoo. Boo hoo. Come, come on. Come on. These Boo-hoo. guys are humans. Come on. You talk to the Red Sox. You know they're humans. The same they with the Marlins. Humans. You are they are humans, but Jazz is not good enough at baseball. So that's Jazz Chisholm. Tremendous ball player. All right, Joe. Who are you <laughs> taking? It's not well, actually, you could take Thick Will. You could do it. No, I'm not gonna double up here, but uh using Pat's logic about that right field porch. I think this is the series that David Hamilton sends it over the yard. Ooh. Just get the nice fly ball out there. It could be a fly ball anywhere else. Not at Yankee Stadium. David Hamilton breaks through, I guess, a mini slump, you could call it. Maybe not as hot as he was recently. Uh, but he's going to send it out against the Yankees. I like the pick. I thought about I thought about that for the exact same reason. But then I, I just think was it's, like, it's got to pick a statement. I think but it's I a like line it. drive that gets it's like a 315 foot line drive that like sneaks over the wall. And it's one that if the Yankees hit it, we would be pissed and we'd be like Yankee stadium bullshit. But when David Hamilton does it, oh, Yankee, stadium bullshit. Yankee stadium bullshit. That's right, man. We love it. That Reese hit a home run a couple years ago at Yankee stadium where it was like the classic, it was on Apple TV. It was like first row in right field. Also, one more one more thing for my Jaron Duran thing. Did you guys see those the Yankee fans uh, making Jaron Duran Yankee hat swaps on Twitter? You guys see those? What? Why? They were they were making Jaron Duran Yankee at it. So there's no way he doesn't go deep. I'm very confident. Oh in this my one. god! Wait, 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 wait. Why would that is so sad and pathetic? They're they're slump. They're in the worst slump of the season, and they're making hat swaps of a player from the biggest rival team, from the guy yep. who plays the position, who kind of sort of like took over for Verdugo who they have yep. that is so fucking sad and pathetic why <laughs> I don't know I, I saw I saw two of them what a bunch of losers are you kidding me that's like if we were like 
We're desperate. We need like Clay Holmes or something. Get the fuck out of here. That's so it's he's not even a free agent. It's not like, oh, you did it with Aaron Judge. Like, all right. Anyway, God, I get so fired up when the Yankees are uh, are our next opponent. Red Sox next opponent. So, yeah, enjoy your hat swaps. It'll never fucking happen. All right, Sammy, what do we got? <laughs> Man, I'm so fired up, boys. But you know, it's time to fire. It's time to chill out. It's time for guys being dudes. No oh, Yankees, just Red Sox here. We're all winners. But you gotta pick a player who played for both the Red Sox and the Yankees. And remember, we've done this one before, so you gotta get creative here. And none of the obvious ones. No Johnny Damon. No Jacoby Ellsbury. Even no Eduardo Nunez. I wanted you guys to get weird with these players. So, um, Pat, you weren't here last uh, episode. Let's hear. Who do you got? Ooh, I will go with. I'll go with Jaron Duran. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make that same joke. God. No, um, it's not a weird one name wise. It's a weird one because seeing it, him on that fucking horse throws me off every time. Wade Boggs won a uh, World Series uh -huh. with the Yankees. The ho riding the horse on the field, everything that would be like to me. Granted, I was not alive when Wade Boggs won that World Series, but knowing him as a Red Sox legend and seeing the picture of him with the trophy on the horse and all that bullshit is what I imagine it would have been like if Kyrie was horsing the Larry O'Brien Trophy. Yeah, Sammy, that must have killed you. Yeah, I didn't like that. That was one of my least favorite. Uh crystal bombs yes i did hate that i was negative two years old when that happened i remember now, okay. it um, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right all right gordon who do you got uh i want to use mine it's a little bit different i want to use mine as a quick shout out to rob ref snatter who does work for this by the way he was a yankee came up with them but i want to use it as a shout out because he was doing that thing with nesson where i don't know really what it was for but he was like quickly rattling off like hey like i grew up here i went to high school here. I went to college at this place and then I got drafted by, Oh, I'm not going to name them. And then I did this. That was great. He was like, I'm not, I'm not going to, not going to do it. So props to Rob Ref Snyder, true Bostonian, true winner made an awesome diving catch in this series. I hope to see him playing more. Uh, good to see him playing, getting in there today, getting starting in the second game. So love Rob Ref Snyder. Hopefully he has a big series against his former team. Screw them. It's going to be wild when he, he takes over for Alex Cora as manager when Cora goes to the Dodgers and wins three World Series with him and then Rob Ref Snyder is the Red Sox player manager. Anyway, uh, my pick for guys being dudes. You guys probably don't remember him. This guy's more from my time. You guys ever heard of Guy Cooper? Who could forget him? <laughs> Who could forget Guy Cooper? He was a right-handed pitcher. He pitched a total of 11 major league games, good for a 5.33 ERA. With the Red Sox, he pitched 10 games for a 4.88 ERA, 24 innings. Not the worst ever, just not great, a little bit below average. It was a, uh, a memorable 24 innings. Only gave up one home run, but he, oh my God, he walked 11 batters and all right, so yeah, this guy wasn't good, but with the Yankees, he really settled into his own. He pitched one game, three innings, did give up a run, but only one run as a member of the Yankees. Gotta love Guy Cooper, um, born in 1893. Those were good times. I remember those those days. Debuted in 1914, if you remember that. Those games were broadcast over Mud Radio. That was, I remember being in the ball yard. I actually... I went to the movie theater to listen to the game that day. It only cost a nickel, which was a little bit out of my price range, but paid it up anyway. And then by 1915, he had retired as a 22-year-old pitcher. Uh, yeah, lest we forget Guy Cooper, one of, one of the players who played of all time. You must have hated having to wear suits to, the, to go watch Guy Cooper at the ballpark. Oh, it must have been Dude. terrible. I remember the first time I, I finally joined the Royal Rooters at Fenway Park uh, in my suit. I was finally allowed to cheer. Uh, but you were only supposed to golf clap early on, early days. But then uh, when I turned 30 back in the 19, uh, early 1920s is when I uh, joined the Royal Rooters. And they, they let me yell at the ballpark for the first time. And boy, did boy did Guy Cooper uh, hear it from me. So, yeah. That is my pick, Guy Cooper. We got Guy Cooper, Rob Ref Snyder, and then uh, Pat. Who'd you pick? You picked uh, 
Wade Boggs. Oh, Wade Boggs. Yeah, yeah. I can't believe you would do that to me. But uh, yeah, greatest segment of all time. Thank you, boys. Yes, sir. And uh, started the episode with it, but going to end with it too. Big shout out to Matt Andrees, who is still kicking it in the majors and getting the loss today against the Red Sox. I cannot believe that it's the year 2024, but appreciate you guys tuning in for episode 90 of play Tessie before you go do whatever else you're going to do with your day. Remember hit that subscribe button, whether you're on Apple, Spotify, or the Odyssey app, hit the subscribe button, rate us five stars helps us out a ton. Check it out on YouTube as well. We're on the WBEI channel. We've got a play Tessie playlist so you can find all of our episodes there and you can hit the thumbs up on those. And we'd really appreciate that can also check us out on the socials. Follow the socials at Twitter or on Twitter and Instagram at Play Tessie. Good content coming in there all the time. Episodes, interviews with the players. Like we've got really good stuff there. So you should definitely be following us there. But we got another one dropping for you guys tomorrow. Episode 91 coming out the very next day. We just keep churning out content for you guys. Socks are making a run. Play Tessie's making a run too. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. But till next time. This has been Play Tessie episode 90. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.